Hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. In this video, we are going to take a look on the different aspects of modeling and designing steel trusses in Autodesk Robot. So to start with, I'm going to select me the three-dimensional bulging design. I'm going to model a hangar or a storage that is 15 meters wide and 25 meters long now the 15 meters are just going to be one big span of 50 meters and in the Y I'm going to have it 25 meters at spans of 5 which means each span is 5 meters. If you're going to apply you can see that the grid is now generated. So if you go to your Z axis you see that the Z axis is between 0 and 8. That's due to the fact that story 1 is defined between 0 and 8. I don't want that. I want my hangar height to be at 5 meters. I just go to my stories delete that and add a story at 5 meters and that's that. So if you go to your view you can see the grid system of your hangar. Now the roof of this hangar is going to be modeled by a truss and as we know a truss typically becomes economical for spans greater than 40 feet or 12 meters and this is according to a study done by Fisher in 1993. According to this a truss roof system is going to be used in this hangar. I first of all model my column. So I just hit on columns and define me a column section. Now the nice thing about robot is that previous sections that you have defined remain here. So I'll just choose a placeholder section of 16 by 57. Now for more information about how to model lines you can double check the video above. Uh, furthermore uh, if you want more information about modeling steel stru structures you can also double check the other video which is going to show up right now. Now our story is 5 now so you can actually either type 5 here or basically select the height like this and you start drawing your columns. And you see whether that we have drawn our columns of course the orientation of my columns is correct. The strong axis is in the big span. Now the column length is 5 meters. This could affect the axial design because 5 meters might have an effect on the buckling of those columns. And now it's time to model trusses. There are some common types of trusses used when we support roofs. Those are, for example, the Hoey truss, the Warren truss, the Pratt truss, and others. One important question that needs to be answered is the height of the truss, as well as the number of bays of a truss. Now, for more information about the basics of truss design, you should refer to any textbook in steel structures. I am assuming that you have the minimum requirement of knowing how steel trusses are modeled and designed. So, okay, one important aspect of those steel trusses is to determine the height of that steel truss because it affects how well our truss is designed. Having a higher truss means that the loads in the lower and upper cords become lower. Having a shallower truss means that those loads get larger. Uh, so it becomes an economics game because if you increase the height, you will actually add more member length to the truss, but you would have smaller cross sections for the cords. And having a smaller, shallower truss means that the truss member's length for diagonals and verticals are going to be shorter, but still your cords will have more force and would cause larger cross sections. So it becomes a kind of an optimization problem. Luckily for us, the American Institute for Steel Constructions, AISC, it's basically the institute responsible for the AISC LRFD design code, the code I'm using right now. This AISC institute found out that a span to depth ratio of 15 to 20 will yield economic trusses when they are loaded uniformly. This is also according to Fisher in 1993. So right. I will use this span to depth height at least to have a starting value. So my span is 50 meters, which means that my height should be something between 1 meter and 75 centimeters or 0.75 meters. And this 1 meter is considered the minimum height. I will choose my truss to have a height of 1.5 meters. Now this 150% is only a personal recommendation, which means that you might have your different recommendations. This is absolutely fine. Another thing I like to do is I like to have my bay spacing equal to my truss height. This is something I personally like to do and I will do it right now. This is once again a personal opinion, 
but I will just do it anyway. So I'm going to make me a truss using the Pratt truss configuration. So how can I do that? Of course you can start um, defining your grids and drawing the truss elements element by element, which would take a lot of time. However, I'm going to use robots structure library to define my trusses. So I just go to structure, insert from library, and you can see that I can select typical structures, beams, frames, and trusses. And you can see the truss, the Pratt truss configuration here. So if I click on that and hit on the OK, you can see that the dialog opens. Now the first thing you notice is that you see a truss here. Of course, this is totally out of position. So we need to start modifying that stuff. Now, first of all, the length of the truss. The length of the truss is 15 meters. So you can type 15 meters here, or you can basically click from here to here. And it, you see that there is 15 meters. If you hit apply, it reflects your 15 meters in the truss configuration. The height of the truss is 1.5, and the number of fields is going to be 10, because my bay is going to be 1.5. Continuous chords is a yes, which means that my lower chord is going to be one continuous steel profile. The moments are released, of course, because we are doing a truss, and trusses are released in moments. For the inset, first of all, the insertion point is here. If you hit apply, now the truss is in the correct position. So let's get back to look what more has for us in store. If you go to more, you can basically make the truss inclined, which means that you can apply an inclination, for example, 8.3 meters, and you can see that my truss now got inclined. Of course, a very dangerous issue here is that my truss is now not connected to the column, meaning that there is no load transfer. Uh, in other words, I should have done my column here to be 5.3 meters high, to have an inclination for the truss. Now, why do we incline our trusses? Now, one of the trivial reasons why we incline our trusses is for rain runoff and snow melting and runoff because we don't want rain and snow to accumulate on our truss. The second thing is maybe you want even to uh, incline your truss even further. This is recently becoming a trend because we like to have our green roofs, meaning a roof where you have solar panels on top of that, and usually the inclination of the roof is calculated so that the solar panels are in the optimal place to face the sun. Please notice that this little inclination doesn't affect our verticals. Our verticals remain verticals. Now, you don't need to have an inclination from one side. You can perfectly have an inclination like this. For example, if you say D1 equals one meter, you have a inclined uh, Pratt truss. And if you say that your D2 is 0.5, then you have a double inclined Pratt truss. All right, so I'll just leave here an inclination of one meter just for the sake of showing you this in the model. And the inclination helps you once again to have runoff. Uh, also, furthermore, please notice that the inclination of roofs have an effect on the wind loads. For the sections, now usually the diagonals and the verticals have a double L leg shaped section to facilitate connecting it with the cords. So robot actually uses uh, perfectly sensible sections for all of those elements. You can see that if you just hit on apply and okay, you can see that Autodesk robot generates us the truss. Now you can see that the verticals and diagonals are double L shaped because it facilitates the connection between the verticals and diagonals with the cords because each part of the L shape is connected to the other side of the cord. Now there should be a small gap between the two L's, but this is just a rendering issue. So I'll just leave it as is. Okay, so I'm just going to copy my truss. So I will select the truss and I will select the top nodes because I want to drag the top nodes. And you can refer to the copying and dragging characteristics in the video tips and tricks uh, linked above. So I will select my truss with the upper nodes and then I will select also with the control key my lower chord. So you can see that my truss is now selected. Please notice I intentionally selected the upper nodes and intentionally didn't select the lower nodes because the nodes that are selected will affect what gets dragged. So I'll just go to edit, edit, move or copy. I'll drag it along, move it five, copy it five times and say that my translation vector is from here to here and you produce a perfect roof. Now I've reached a milestone in my modeling. If I run the analysis, there might be some instabilities and please notice that having two-dimensional trusses in a 3D problem becomes an extremely hard issue to stabilize. And there are other things I want to finish up with my model. So I'll just run the analysis and see all kinds of errors happening. So as expected, I have some instabilities of type 2. And I also have another error, which is the element is defined outside stories. So I'll tackle that first. If you double click on this, 
you can see that a robot simply doesn't like the fact that you have a truss above your maximum level because you see story one is a height of five whereas the truss has a height of i don't know 1.5 or something or even 2.5 uh, considering the height here so it doesn't like that and to fix that we're just going to define us a new story so i just go here and say 7.5 add this if you close that run the analysis again now you still have the warning because it still thinks that this is defined not in a correct story so if you double click on that it selects them for you and to understand this you see that the story is story one yeah so i just basically select those elements and uh, ask it to do it automatically i'll just let robot deal with this this element defined in a different member is not a big deal like it's just an it's just a nuisance now you see the error has diminished okay so let's take a look on the problems we have now first of all the parallels on our truss have a big eye shape now usually the parallels are not under a huge load and we use c channels sometimes to have parallels or even eye shapes so you can model and modify your parallels another thing that you need to notice is that well those parallels are usually inclined according to the inclination of the truss now the truss is horizontal those would be perfectly fine but because our truss is inclined, I need to incline my parallels to be a little bit more accurate. So let's do that. I'll just define me a section and uh, well, consider a C channel. I'll just select any C channel. Now, this is a placeholder. We will modify it later. So just select me any C channel like this. Now, this C channel needs to have a gamma angle because the parallels are going to rest on your truss. So they are going to be inclined according to the inclination of your truss. Now, I need to calculate the inclination of my truss using some mathematics. The answer on my calculator is 7.6. So, I just basically say 7.6 here as a gamma angle and define my section. I'll edit it. <clears throat> and then I'll add me another section. I'll say this is C6 by 13 number 2, if I want to make a name for that. And I will define my gamma angle to be negative 7.6 degrees. All right. So, I'll just add that. Now I have two cross sections. Now the crest purlin is not going to have a gamma angle. I should basically rename this into a meaningful name. Well, the, for the final one, this one, I'll just make it without a gamma angle. No gamma angle at all. It's not inclined. The reason for that is because the crest purlin is actually going to be perfectly vertical. So I'll just take that, select this, and apply the vertical on the crest purlin. And for the first inclined, I'll just apply this for those purlins so I'll just select those apply that and for the other one i'll select those and apply that our purlins are now inclined with the inclination of the truss this is how it should be now another thing or another issue you would think of is that it seems the purlin is not on top of the section it seems that the purlin is inside the section now in reality the purlins are above the section but this is perfectly fine because the finite element method requires elements to be connected by the nodes so i mean Yes, I know in reality the pearl is above the section, but it doesn't work like that in the finite element. In the finite element method, the members have to connect by the nodes, so that's why you have a small difference here. Now, this is perfectly fine, and that's why our factors of safety exist, because of those modeling approximations that we do. So it seems everything to be fine. If you run the analysis now, you will still have an instability, but at least you have normal purlins, and I'll just take my, open my deflection shape and take a look. All right, now the deflection shape seems to make a little bit sense, but if you look, it seems that some trusses are rotating and it gets worse the closer you are to the edges. The reason behind this rotation is because we have modeled our purlins to be continuous. Now you see this assumption of being continuous and simply supported is an assumption that the designer takes and will have an effect on the structural drawings and the structural design that you will do. And you bear responsibility for this assumption because it has consequences on your design. Uh, for me, I'll just release each span by itself. I'll assume that each one of those purlins is going to be released from both sides. So what do I do? Well, I select those things. Basically, I select this and select this and select this. I select all my purlins and now I'm gonna release them by either selecting a release from here or going to geometry, releases, and use a pinned, pinned release. I'll just apply that, say yes, close, and hit the analysis button. Of course, it's still unstable structure, I know. So if you click on the deflection shape, you can see now that uh, the trusses are not warping because there is no moment transfer between the purlin and the truss. Furthermore, if you go to the uh, 
diagrams from members, open the MY, you can see that the purlins have a simply supported beam moment. And you can also see that the trusses seem to have a moment, which is counterintuitive. We know that trusses are usually released. Now, the reason why there is a moment here is because our truss was drawn using one uh, continuous cord, meaning that the cord is actually having a shear force from the diagonals. And this shear force from the diagonals, because our cord is continuous, causes the bending moment. Now, our diagonals should not have a shear force, but they still have shear forces, and they even have moments. Now, this is strange because, I mean, we have released our diagonals. There shouldn't be any moments. So if you increase the scale, you still see that there are some little moments on our diagonals. You can see that. Now, the reason why our diagonals have moments is because our diagonals have self-weight. And self-weight, even if it's released on both sides, self-weight is going to have a simply supported moment field. And that's the reason why you see moments in the parallels. Of course, you can still eliminate the moments in the cords by releasing everything and splitting the cord into pieces. You can also eliminate the moment in the diagonals by basically deleting the self-weight. However, I will leave it as is because it's more sensible like that. The purlins have a simply supported moment field, so everything seems to be fine. The last thing I have to do is to stabilize my structure. And trust me, stabilizing trusses is a lot worse than stabilizing frames because you have so many elements that are released. So yeah, I mean, we are going to basically brace our trusses. So to do that, well, let's define our braces. So I'll go to geometry members because I want to have a 3D member and I'm gonna define me a bracing. Now, of course, you need to assume a cross section for the bracing and just assume the bracing is a rod. Some people like to use rods, so you can basically use a filled pipe. So let's see if there it is. So basically, if you start looking, you can see each of those families has a little description about that. So you can see that RB is a round bar. There is even square bars, structural tubing. I'll just choose me a round bar and I'll choose now this is a placeholder, I just choose this round bar. I think it's one inch. One inch, yeah, I don't know if it's enough or not. I'll just choose 1.5 inch for good measure. Of course, this is just a placeholder. I'll add that, close. All right, so let's start bracing our truss. Now, since the purlins are released, the purlins don't help anything with regard to the structural stability. It means that each two, two trusses need to be cross-braced to each other. Just go to geometry, members basically, and use the member I just defined for my bracing and do just that. So a cross bracing like this, and a cross bracing like this. No, that, that's not right because it didn't snap, so I made a mistake. So all right, let's delete that and repeat the cross bracing. It's very important that you draw from node to node, and you just do that. Let's take a look now very quickly. Um, let's see. Yeah, well, fantastic, all right. So I have cross braced my first two trusses from one side, of course, one thing to mention is it seems that there is a conflict between the bracings and the purlins. Bars basically go through the purlins. I'll just basically copy that stuff right and left, so I'll just do it very quickly. So by the power of video editing, I've braced my structure, and let's well start analysis. Now, before I start, I'm expecting to have instabilities still because, I don't know, it seems that we have stabilized our truss in the X, Y plane, but in the YZ plane, it's still a house of cards, meaning that if you push with a force, it will fall down. I'm expecting instabilities around UX or something. I don't know. I just, I just run the analysis and see. Well, yeah, what do you know? It's not RX, it's UX. Okay, fine. Uh, I just accept that. Now, there are still instabilities in the direction of X because there is no bracing in the direction of X. So to address this instability, I'll also brace my sides. So I'll just very quickly do that. So you can see where this is going. Instabilities and trusses is an extremely annoying thing and takes time to solve. And it's basically a methodology you follow to start to keep eliminating each instability one at a time to reach a stable structure. This is especially the case for trusses because trusses are inherently released from moment carrying capabilities. So I basically quickly cross brace my sides. Give me a moment. All right, so now I have braced my structure. So let's just run the analysis and see if everything seems to be in order. I think, yeah, yeah, I think we did that. I think, let me see. Yeah, there are no more instabilities. And if you click on the deflection shape, okay, now I have a problem because I need to normalize my deflection shape. So I'll just go to the formation, normalize. You can see that, well, it seems everything to be okay-ish. It seems that my bracings uh, deflect excessively. So I'll just quickly uh, address that. 
by using a bigger cross bracing. So I just go to my selection here, select everything that is round bar 1.5. I just go back and basically change the section from 1.5 to something bigger. I'll just take me a three inch, for example, or something. So I'll just take me a three here. Okay, take it, apply it, run the analysis again. Let's take a look if it became bigger. Yeah, okay, so let's run the analysis again. Yeah, all right, now it's much better like this. Uh, okay, so we have our stable structure. Now it's time to apply some loads. Before I apply some loads, there was a comment from our dear subscriber, Nia Sapai. He was saying that a possible way of eliminating instabilities is to support your structure using fixed supports. Now, I am absolutely with that. This is one possible way of uh, eliminating instabilities to turn your supports into fixed uh, supports which increases the stability of the structure, that's fine. Uh, I still want to mention that uh, a support, a fixed support, has an assumption within it. Uh, if you fix support a point, this means that the point cannot move in any direction and cannot rotate. And if you pin support a point, it means that it cannot move but can rotate. Now, of course, our foundations are somewhat in between being 100% fixed and being 100% pinned. So when you assume a fixed support, you need to make sure that your foundation is large enough to actually provide this fixation. Anyway, I'll just keep it for roller. I'll keep it for roller because a roller will have a column that is under a single curvature buckling and would be safer to design. Also, your entire woman is gonna be on the top with a maximum, so it's in my opinion, I use rollers just for the sake of being a little bit on the safe side when it comes to buckling. All right, now, once again, roller or fix, it depends on the assumption and it depends on the conditions of your foundation. I'll just leave it like that. Maybe I will explain more details about this in the future and even how to model a semi-rigid support. This is something for the future. For now, I'm just here. So yeah, our initial check is complete. So let's apply some claddings because I want this to be loaded. So I'll apply some claddings and uh, it's gonna be a one-way cladding in the direction of the purlins because the claddings or basically the roof is above the purlin. So I will only make it one way in the direction of the purlins to make sure that the purlins are the only ones that feel the load of the roof. So this is gonna take a lot of time. So I'll just show you one of them. I just go to geometry and then select claddings and I want my cladding to be one way in the direction of X because you see I want the load distribution to be in the direction of X so I'll just click on those four points basically I just need to make sure I'm selecting them correctly yep I've done that and now I have one cladding of course this is gonna take a lot of time so allow me to, to just quickly edit that into the video. There is something very important I wanted to check. Uh, and before I did my off-screen modeling, I thought I, would, I wanted to share this with you. <coughs> so you see, first of all, when I selected claddings and direction X, well, it's not direction X, it's actual direction Y, because the local X axis is in this direction, and I want to distribute my loads in this direction, so I want to change this from X to Y. So I'll just go ahead and change it to Y. Of course, I will run the analysis again. This is a quick check I like to do usually whenever I reach a milestone. So if I run my analysis again, you can see that, okay, it seems that it's distributing in the y-axis. Of course, please notice that to access this, you have to right-click here, go to display, and select load distribution regions under the loads tab. All right. Now, the problem I have here is it seems that my bracings are being loaded by the claddings. Now, this doesn't work like that because... I know my bracing seems to be in the plane of the cladding, but in reality, the purlins are above the truss and the cladding is even above the purlins. So the bars or the bracings have no business in getting loads from the cladding. So this is a modeling mistake. Now to fix that, if you click on the bar here and on this bar here, for example, you can see that in the properties section in the model, you can see that there is a trapezoidal and triangular method analyze, meaning that this member is going to be taken into consideration whenever a robot tries to analyze a cladding using the trapezoidal and triangular method. Now, I, want, I don't want this to happen, so I'll click on analyze and select ignore, and then run my analysis. Now, if I'm correct, this member should not get any loads from the cladding, whereas this is still going to get some loads. So I run my analysis and you can see that this member now doesn't get any loads from the cladding, but still does, this still does. 
So if you select that, and basically select TM Ignore, and run the analysis again, you can see now that my cladding distributes loads exactly as I want it to be. Now, of course, I don't only have two bracings. I have a lot of bracings, so I select all of them by selecting the round bars here, and for the trapezoid, I'll select Ignore, just to make sure that my elements are not going to be taken into consideration when I draw claddings. Fantastic. So now I'm ready to draw me some claddings. So I'll now basically uh, video edit this and show you the results. So after finishing half of the roof, which took a little bit of time, I just once again run my quick analysis and make sure that everything seems to be fine. I kind of like to do that. So I just apply and yep, everything seems to be in working order. So let's talk about the second half. There is a mirror command in Autodesk Robot, so I will show you that. Now, first of all, I will select all claddings by clicking here, right click, select all. So I have all my claddings now. And then going to edit, edit, uh, vertical mirror. Now I can make a mirror and I want to mirror this around the YZ plane. So my mirror is going to be in the YZ plane. The point is going to be this point, the mirror point, And you can see that oh, it, it worked fine. As a matter of fact, I could have used the mirror command to mirror my bracings. So, well, this is a new addition. Anyway, I'll just run my analysis now. The mirror command seems to be really nice, so it saves a lot of time. And you can see that my truss is perfectly fine. It's analyzing everything as it should be. And yeah, well, uh, we have accomplished a lot of things right now. Now, of course, my loads are placeholder loads, so I have to modify them. So I'll just go to loads. Uh, first of all, I select my two load cases, so I just basically define me a live load case and define me a combination loads manual. I'm defining manual combinations, although there is a possibility to define automatic combinations. So I apply that. Now I've, everything seems to be fine. Still, I need to fill my loads with values. Now, first of all, all my claddings have values, but the values are dummy values. I just added them for the sake of showing the load distribution regions or areas. If you go to a table, you can see that my dummy load is 5 or something. I think, yeah, that's 5. I don't want that. Let's delete that. Now, of course, it's your responsibility to calculate the loads applied in the dead case and the live case on this roof, uh, which comprises of basically whatever you are using to cover this roof. It could be a corrugated metal sheet uh, or uh, even a concrete thing. I don't know. It's up to you. I just basically assume it's a corrugated uh, steel sheet. So if I say, for example, that my corrugated sheet is 10 millimeters thick, now, of course, you will have to design your corrugated sheet first. You have to select it, and you can do that from the load tables that the manufacturers provide you. You need to provide the loads, live loads, and expected dead loads, except the weight of the corrugated sheet, and then you would get or select the, and, of course, the span length, and then you were able to select the best corrugated sheet used for this, uh, for this, Roof. Now, I'm just going to assume that my corrugated sheet is basically 10 millimeters thick. Now, I have no idea, to be honest. It's not part of my example today to uh, calculate the corrugated sheet's design. I'll just say that's basically 10 millimeters thickness. So, 10 millimeters multiplied by 77 kilonewtons per meter gives you a dead load of 0.77. This is the own weight. And let's say that you have some finishing materials and some air ducts and some false ceiling maybe or something hanging down so I, I don't know I just basically give a dead load of 5 kilonewtons per meter square just for good measure now please notice those dead loads are inaccurate it's the responsibility of the structural engineer to calculate those this is not a structural engineering lecture but it's a lecture in softwares with some educative aspects of structural engineering so just add me a 5 kilonewtons surface load for dead and I will add me 3 kilonewton load for live load. Please notice that three might be too much because uh, this is a truss with corrugated sheet. So usually we just apply a maintenance load of, I think, one kilonewton per meter square or something. It depends on the design code. Germans call it man last, which means man load, which means the maintenance load. I'll just apply three kilopascals live load and leave you to deal with that yourself. Uh, I'll just leave it like that. So now I'll run my analysis. And well, let's take a look. So my analysis is complete and now I have to do my quick model checks to make sure that first of all, the analysis makes sense and second of all, everything seems to be fine. So first of all, I'll just check my displacement. Displacement seems to be large. It seems to be 100 
millimeters, which is almost 10 centimeters. Now, of course, the question is, who is suffering the most? It seems that my purlins are suffering the most with my rods, but I don't like that. I don't like that my rods and purlins deflect the same. Having rods and purlins deflect the same seems to suggest to me that although this robot basically connected the purlins with my bracings, which is something I don't want because I've said before that this is only an optical illusion. The purlins should not connect to the rods and there shouldn't be any force transfer between the purlins and the rods. Now, how can I make sure of that? I right click on the rod and click on object properties and take a look on the shear force diagram of that thing. There might be a load transfer happening here. I'm not really sure about that. I can see two jumps. If I go to my moment diagram, yeah, I think there is load transfer between the purlins and the bracings. So that's not correct. This means that actually the purlins are being carried by those members, which is incorrect because the purlins and the bracings should not carry each other. And to even show you that further even more, you can actually turn on the finite element of the Autodesk robot. So if you go to display, go to model, you can see in the calculation element, you can select the number of calculation element like this and apply. Now I can barely see that. There is a number here, 477. This is the finite element member number. And you can see another number, which is 4.478, which means, yes, Autodesk robot has basically discretized my member here and now this no this bar this uh, bracing actually carries the loads with the purlins which is not what i want so this is a modeling mistake and i have to deal with that so no not everything seems to be in order i have a problem to deal with now this is really really advanced stuff but well it's practical advanced stuff so i have to explain it right now you see i want autodesk robot to ignore the intersection between the purlins and the bracings because yes it seems in the model that it intersects but in reality they don't intersect because the purlins are a level higher than my bar so this intersection is not correct and the problem is that autodesk robot seems to be using this intersection and modeling this accordingly so how do i do that well now to do that we need to modify the way autodesk robot generates its finite element model now this requires some knowledge in the finite element method and i'll just basically explain it as simple as i can you will go to analysis analysis types now in the analysis types this will be explained later but in the analysis type you have a structure model now the structure model when it generates the structure models it actually intersects each beam or member with the other members and uh, generates little finite elements based on those intersections this is even case when you have plates so I want my bracings not to be intersected with anything. I want the intersection between my bracings and any other members, in this case purlins, to be absolutely ignored, which means I need to ignore those bracings from my model generation. So I can actually add a number of elements that are ignored when my model is being generated. Now the usage of this option is extremely rare. I rarely remember myself using this before, but I want to select all my bracings to be ignored, meaning it's not going to be intersected with any other member, but it's going to be only intersected with the nodes. So I just click on that. The usual selection window opens. I'll basically select me a member with a section three, which is basically our bar section. I close, now it's here. Now I can save or just basically calculate. And if I calculate right now, you can see the big difference. The difference now, is that the oh, first of all I need to remove the cross section is that my bracings deflect independently from my purlins you see that the purlins are suffering there is huge deflection now I need to basically change the the scale just to make sense of it so I'll just basically decrease the scale a little bit and you see the purlins deflect independently from the bracings this is exactly what I want so fine Mission accomplished, and my model now is absolutely correct. So yeah, that's a quick uh, modeling check. Now to the design part. I basically design my truss. So how can I design that? Well, I just basically go to my design, <coughs> design of steel members. Now, of course, this is something that was covered in a video before. I just very quickly do that. So first of all, I want to have my groups. I create a new group, P1. 
please refer to the basic video for steel design so I just basically select my members you can select them via the cross section or you can select them yourself via the mouse for now I'll select them via the mouse so I'll just delete that select this and apply my selection and well this is uh, C1 and I'm gonna use a 992 50 kilo KSI these sections uh, I think are, those are I sections so I basically use the AISC I section W shapes and hit the apply button so yeah that's my first group so I'll save that now for the second group I'm going to make a group for my diagonals and verticals go to my sections now those are double leg or double angle so I'll go to my section go to the EISC first of all I will delete all the W shapes and uh, in the EISC I'm going to select the double DL which means double leg to apply this section this selection and say I'm going to group my cords upper and lower together group bracings and I think we're ready now to do some magic the first thing is I can basically do a code group verification and select all groups and well I'll just do that and cal calculate well I don't think it will be working and yeah it doesn't work so you see like we have some problems here with our double legs let's take a look incorrect section now why is that it's incorrect because you see that during the design uh, the design equation is basically 1.44 meaning that my section is being over uh, stressed it has a 144 percent force when compared to the resistance which means our section is bad let's take a look green means okay red means strength is bad yellow means Stability is bad, so the length doesn't work. For example, here, 302 to 300 is unstable. Red, yellow means both. And you can see that my design is not good. So, okay, let's design that. So I basically go to code group design, select all my groups by going to list, all, close, and, well, let's run the calculation. And robot starts selecting sections. Now, I've talked about what this result, this, this warning. Uh, this warning basically means that there is some members where there is no lateral buckling analysis. Okay, fine, just accept that. And you can see that robot suggests new sections. And I can basically use those new sections by hitting the change all button. So allow me to show you. Those are my bars right now. You can see that the bracings are being selected to be a much larger bracing. So you can see those three inch bracings are going to be larger. It's really large, by the way. I'm really surprised. I think the reason why it's taking a larger section is because of the stability. Yeah, see, uh, the reason why it's taking a larger section because of the stability, you can, this is I, an equation in the AISC code. Of course, you can overwrite that using your own engineering sense. I will just stick with the AISC and change all. Now, personally, I'm really not liking those bracings, but I'll just stick to the AISC code. Please notice that you should use your own engineering sense and realizing that, hey, maybe you can sacrifice some stability for the sake of economy, but of course, uh, you need to do, be able to do it yourself. Now, our sections have changed, which means the internal forces are now null and void. You have to calculate and analyze again. And after you analyze, you have to do a group, code group verification because the internal forces have changed. So if you calculate right now, you see that some of our members are now incorrect because they got new forces and they became overstressed. So once again, you have to iterate another iteration for the design. So let's go to code group design, hit the calculation button. It is now suggesting a larger section. And I'll just basically change everything right now. So change all. You see, it's once again an iterative uh, task where you have to keep changing your sections, reanalyzing the structure, and checking again, and so on, and so on. And so after several iterations, you can see that now all my groups are perfectly fine. And this ends the design of this Trust. One final thing I want to cover before I sign off is the modeling of wind loads. Now, there are design codes to model wind loads and usually the engineer calculates the wind loads separately and then defines some claddings to apply those wind loads. So I, first of all, I will define me some claddings. So we have done our claddings. Now, I have mentioned before that to model wind loads, there are two options. The first option is that the designer basically uh, calculates the wind loads in the Excel sheet and then applies the wind loads on the different surfaces here using a separate case. Of course, then he will have to define the correct combinations and this is something I will leave for you. The point I'm trying to make right now is to show you how Autodesk Robot uh, simulates wind loads on the structure. So if you go to loads, there is wind load simulation. You can actually generate wind loads. And of course, the, the robot asks you uh, 
on which direction the window is going to be. You can actually mix a lot of directions that you want. I'll just leave it at X. The base wind speed, this is something you have to know from your own location, uh, which is something that all codes use. For example, the, ES, the ASCE requires the input of a basic wind speed, and usually you will find this sometimes in kilometer per hour, which means that you can convert this into meter per second. It depends on your location. For the elements, I'm going to apply the... I'm going to delete this first. I'm going to apply on all, and even the openings and panels should be closed for wind flow. This is something that he will do himself. So I'll basically leave this as is. For the wind profile, now it gets a little bit tricky, because you can actually define the wind profile for yourselves. You can basically add some points, basically by dragging like this. You can add here another point to drag this like this. You can add all kinds of points to simulate a wind profile. Now the wind profiles are usually parabolic in nature, so I just leave it like this. Now this is really technical and you need to have some studies to be able to determine the wind profile that you have, uh, which is the velocity factor. Now a point I want to make is that usually the wind speed on the ground is different than the wind speed on the upper atmosphere because you have all kinds of friction and turbulence happening due to the fact that you have buildings around you. So I'll just leave it as is and I'll just start my calculation. This will take some time. So it's actually meshing and simulating stuff. You can see that it's simulating wind now. It's really cool to watch. So I'll just basically wait and see what happens. And when it, once it's done, it tells you, well, the wind simulation is complete. And there is a generated load case, which is a full name. Now, by the way, I actually generated my own wind load case, but it seems that robot has different uh, opinions. And it gives you its own uh, generated case. Now, the really cool thing about this, now the really cool thing about this, now of course if you close the wind, it will remove the loads, so you have to open them again, is that it shows you everything. It shows you the pressure on the windward side, the suction on the leeward side, I'm supposing it's suction, it depends of course on the orientation. You can see all kinds of suction and pressure on the uh, roof, so it's really nice to see this happening. And well, you can use the loads you have here because you have pressures now. You can use the loads you have here to actually apply a wind load or a wind case and perform your design using this wind case. Now basically this is all what I wanted to talk about. It's only a small taste of what Autodesk Robot can and will do for you. I will talk about more advanced topics in the future videos. I only want to mention that there are two, uh, two really technical topics I mentioned today, which is basically when we went to our analysis types and modified the structural model and when we simulated wind loads. The rest is basically normal technical tutorial. Those were the only two highly advanced points that I wanted to cover in this tutorial. All right, so that's it. I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. If you enjoyed the video, of course, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. It helps immensely. This is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we will catch you in the next video.